Brother Mike, thank you. Elaine, you know, if nothing else, you need to remember that God loves you. And while we were yet sinners, God demonstrated his love toward us by sending his son as a sacrifice for all of our sins. It wasn't how good we were. It's really how bad we were. It's how good he is. So never lose touch with that. Sometimes we get in the wrong place. We think we can work this thing out. But apart from him, we can't work anything out. Amen. Yeah. With him we have all good things. But the psalmist said, without him I have no good things. But through Christ I can do all things. And with God, all things are... Wow. Isn't that all encouraging? <laughs> things... You know, it's good to memorize scripture even if they're little. And speaking of that, are you all keeping up with your reading? Kevin, you didn't get them this morning, did you? We're, we, we, today's day nine, and listen, if you're not up to date, you can catch up. You can catch up. You can do a couple days at a time. I don't know anybody who's had to do that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but anyway, uh, you can catch up. Uh, just a quick advertisement for you version of the Bible. You version. Why you version? Uh, if you get the app on your phone, uh, it has a little box that looks like a Bible. You tap on it, uh, then it gives you a place to put in the Scripture, and you put in the Scripture, and the Scripture will pop up in a little play button. Boom! And there's this really nice man who reads it to us. I mean to me. I mean to you. And so we can stay updating his Word. Isn't it good to have his Word? And the psalmist said, I buried it within my heart that I might not sin against you. Okay, how many times have you moved in your life? Uh, let's, let's try to get a number here. How many of you have moved more than two times in your life? Okay. How many of you have moved more than five times? Raise your hand. How many of you have moved more than ten times in your life? How many have moved more than 15 times? Okay, we're still going. How many have moved more than 20 times in your life? Okay, Kim, anybody at 19? Anybody at 19? Can I get 19? Can I get? Okay. Nobody at 19. Kim's moved 19 times. Her dad was in the military for 25 years, and that happened. Sometimes preacher's kids have to move a lot. Sometimes that happens. Uh, I was afraid of moving, so y'all can't get rid of me. But when we moved here in 2005, my son wasn't happy with us because he had to leave his friends behind. And I tried to explain it to him that God told us to move. And so then his sweet mama said, now honestly, God told us to move. And he said, you're just saying that because daddy said it. Sometimes in life we have to move. And uh, there's been a lot of research done. Did you know that the average person in the United States moves 11.7 times? I can't figure out the 0.7. Maybe it's kind of like next door or to the basement or something, but the average person in the United States moves 11.7 times. Now, there was, uh, there was some tough news. If you're younger than 18, Landon, uh, a person can expect to move another nine times. If you're under 18, you've got nine to go. Harmony, you've got nine to go at least, okay? That's a lot, isn't it? You think about moving? That often, uh, then. But the good. Let me let me tell you. If you're over 45, let me encourage you. If you're over by by the age of 45, the expected number of moves is only 2.7. There's that 0. 0.7 again. So if you're over 45, you've only got roughly three more moves, and you'll be home free. But you know, I got to thinking about it. No matter where we are in life, we got one more move. And that kind of excited me. I got to thinking about that at the early service. We all got one more move in us. You may say, I am never leaving my house. Let me tell you about my Nana. Uh, Grandma Harding lived to be 95. Uh, she would have been 96 like two weeks later when, when she passed away. But Grandma told us, she said, don't you take me out of my house. Don't you? She said, if you need to, you lock me in my closet. But don't you take me out of my house. And I said, Nana, we're not going to lock you in your closet. She only had one move left in her, and she moved on home. There's coming a day when we're all going to get that last move in, and, and you won't have to call U-Haul. You won't have to call two men in a truck. Uh, that there's, you're not going to have to worry about it. 
Sue actually said, I did preach one good sermon. She, she testified to that today. And, and there's a passage when it talks about when the rich man and Lazarus died, the, 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 rich, the, Lazarus, the rich man, he just died, it said, but the Lazarus was escorted to heaven. John 14, Jesus says, uh, if I go to prepare a place for you, then I will come back. I will come back and receive you so that you can be where I am. I think the last move is already pre-planned, but I want to read you a brief scripture. Uh, Kevin got us up to uh, the wise men and the wise men leaving. And uh, so often when we hit Christmas Day, we're done with baby Jesus. We're done with Jesus the child. And we forget there are some scriptures about his life uh, before age 30, before the beginning of his ministry, we are taught some things that happened to him. Two weeks ago, I talked about him going to the temple to be dedicated because his parents did what God had told them to do. He was also circumcised. But anyway, uh, they did that. And, and then we know that they had moved because uh, the wise men took them about two years to find him, or that's part of the text today that I'm going to read you. And so we get to see a little window into the young man, Jesus, or the child. Now, my grandmother had a book, Nana had a book, and it, was, you know, it wasn't a true book, but it talked about his early years. Have any of y'all ever seen that, about the early years of Jesus? And it just has some fantasy. Fan, fan, fantasy. That was kind of fantastical. No. Let's make words up while we're here. But, it, but stories that could have taken place, but we have biblical text, so let's, let's stick with the Bible. This is Matthew chapter 2, 13 through 23. Now when they had departed, Kevin's wise, man, wise men, uh, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt and was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its districts, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Now when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the young child's life are dead. Then he arose, took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, he shall be called a Nazarene. Now I really didn't want to read that last verse for some of you Nazarenes because you remind us Wesleyans that Jesus was called a Nazarene. We understand that, okay? We understand that. Uh, a lot of scripture is being fulfilled in here, but, but I, 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 you saw the title, maybe you looked at the bulletin, On the Move, the, uh, uh, the early years on the move. Um, as I was talking about, we often have to move in life, but you know there's something that God wants from us. He wants us to be ready to move when He asks us to move. He wants us to be available. We don't have to be able. Obviously, I'm in the ministry. You don't have to be able, but you have to be available. And God wants us in a place or a position. When He speaks, we can say yes, and we're ready to go, wherever He would have us to go. 
It may be to get up on Sunday morning and go to church, right? It may be to walk across uh, to the kitchen and talk to a family member. Uh, it may be to walk across to your neighbor's house. Uh, it may be to speak up at work to someone. But God wants us available to move. Well, our text begins with the great escape. The great escape. You know there's been a movie about that and probably multiple movies about that. But we have, here is, is Joseph and Mary and the baby Jesus. Now, what's interesting, when the wise man came, and I could be wrong, I'll get Ricky and, and Kevin to fact check me, they don't mention Joseph when the wise men show up at the house. Did you notice that? I may be wrong. Somebody can bring that up. Google it, okay? So what's interesting here is, is Joseph is not a part of the wise men showing up. And I was reading a bunch of stuff about it, like, where was Joseph? What, what could have been happening? Somebody said he probably was at work. And that's a good place to be. You're supposed to be, you know, when you can, be at work. But here we have Joseph and Mary and baby Jesus, the wise men, have just left, and the Lord starts talking to him. The Lord says, I need to, I need to talk to you. And so there's prepaid planning. Now, what's really interesting is, is what happened, what Kevin shared last week. What did the wise men bring baby Jesus? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Um, gold had great value, right? Also, frankincense had great value, and probably myrrh as well. And as I was reading about this text, one of the things I never thought about, when you go on a trip, what do you need? Money. And if you have to pack up and move to another town, you don't know if you have a job waiting on you, do you? You don't know what's going to happen. And I think about some of the moves I've made in my life. I remember uh, when, when I felt the call to ministry and I, I was talking to Papa on the front porch and I said, we're going to move. He said, how are you going to take care of my daughter? I said, I'm going to get a job. He said, you're right. You're going to get a job. You don't know, do you? I mean, sometimes when you move, you don't know what's going to happen. It's kind of like graduating from high school or college. You don't know what's next, but you know there's got to be something out there. But God is always, as Jan testified, God's always before us. God knows what we'll need when we'll need it. God has put things before us that we don't even know are happening. Even right this very moment, God is preparing for your next step and what's going to happen. And so God did this uh, for Joseph and Mary, this young little family with baby Jesus. He said, I'll just send you some gold. Now, I'm not preaching a prosperity gospel. I'm just telling you, God knows what you need and what you will need. And so God had prepaid their trip. God says, I got you covered. And it's like, y'all send me the Philippines. Y'all are awesome. Well, there's the master's plan. And so as we get into the text, we hear the words of the Lord. Now, when they departed, so we have this beginning of the text that wise men have departed. An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt and stay there until I bring you word for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Listen, God not only pre-plans and pre-pays our trip, but he says, let me tell you what's going to happen. God already knows everything. Do we get that? You know, sometimes we panic about the future. Does God know? I mean, does, is there anything God doesn't know? And yet we move into the future often with great fear but, but God speaks through the angel to Joseph and says, let, let me tell you what's going to happen. Let me just cover the next couple of years for you. Let me tell you what's on the horizon. you got to go. <laughs> but let me tell you why you've got to go. You've got to go because Herod wants to kill your child. And so I want you to go to Egypt. Now, the interesting thing about Egypt, we know about the exodus. They had to get out of Egypt. But often we were reading God's Word. They went back to Egypt because... Egypt was a place of commerce. Uh, it would have been a place that they could have moved into easily. Uh, it, was, it was a place that they could be cared for. And so, isn't that interesting? God delivered them from Egypt through the Exodus, but tells his own son, his baby boy, you got to go back to Egypt. That's interesting to me, but God knows what he's doing. And so sometimes God may tell you to go somewhere, and you're thinking, we had a problem there before. <laughs> and God says, it's okay, I got you covered. Did you, can you get that? You might have to go where you've been before, where it might not have been good, but God says, I can take care of you in that. Well, it's all the master's plan. And then there was just this nudge of God, this nudge of God, the, 
the moving of the Holy Spirit, the speaking of an angel. It is God communicating to us. And in Sunday school, we learn specifically that angels are messengers. Right? Did I get that right? So angels are... And so God says, I'm going to talk to you if you'll listen to me. And we know that God speaks in a still, still, like not moving, small voice. And sometimes because of the noise around us, it's hard to hear God when he speaks. But, but Joseph has already kind of warmed up to this because he said, you know, this woman I was with, I was going to divorce her. And, the, and God said, no, don't, don't do that. I've got this all covered. Don't Now just listen. I know it looks like a mess. But I got you covered. And so now Joseph gets a, another event in his life. And so this angel says, listen, you're going to leave and then I'm going to tell you to come back. He said, not only are you listening now, but guess what? You're going to have to listen again. And sometimes we might listen well the first time. And God says, I need to speak to you again. Are you still listening? You're going to have to wait. There's going to be an interim. There's going to be some down time, but you've got to be waiting and listening so when it's time, I can tell you what you need to do. And I think one of the struggles even now, and it was it was recorded in Peter, when people were saying, God is slack. What is wrong? I mean, he said he was coming back, and we've waited, and we've waited, and we've waited. Can you imagine the day it happens, it's not going to seem like a long wait. You know, time's flying. And often we wait and we wait and we wait and it gets there and it's un, uneventful in a sense in our minds and yet we know he's coming. Well, the nudge of God, listen, God wants us to be available to nudge. On the move was the plan of the Father to protect his son. God's going to protect us if we'll let him. And the Father knows all. He knows everything. Well, there's collateral damage and we already heard about this before, but the wise men didn't go back to Herod. And you remember, uh, Herod says to the wise men, you come back and tell me where this king is. I was reading, I'm sure Kevin read it uh, for last week, where it says, you don't go to a king and say, let me tell you, I, I, I found your replacement. You don't do that. It's just not nice. And Herod was not about that. And, and we know what Herod would have done in the first place if the wise men had gone back. Herod said, I'll go worship him, but he would have gone and killed him, right? Because that's what the text bears out. Herod said, I'll take care of the competition. I don't need any competition, so I'll kill the competition. But the wise men, now get this, and Kevin made this clear. That was really good. I watched Kevin's sermon. It was really good. Uh, where you talk about the wise men being Gentiles. They, they weren't Jewish followers, but they could hear God. They were willing to listen to God. They, they used the tools that they had, and it sent them in a direction. But when it came down to going back to Herod, a voice spoke, and they said, we ought to listen to that. That's why they were wise men. They said, we're going to listen maybe to a voice that we don't fully understand. But we were all told, like Kevin said, they all had a dream one night, woke up and said, did you have that dream too? <laughs> we don't know how it all worked, but they said, we are not going back to Herod. And they left, and Herod gets really ticked about that. He gets really upset that the wise men have not come back. And so we have the specific timeline. Wisdom prevails and, oh, I'm sorry, wisdom prevails. Uh, the wise men did what God wanted to do. And then we have a specific timeline. We actually kind of get an idea how old Jesus is. Because of what the wise men had told Herod about seeing the star come up, Herod killed the children age what? Two and under. So we kind of get a window of how old Jesus is. Now, I don't know if Jesus went through the terrible twos. I mean, he was a human baby, right? I'm sure he cried, he, was, he, he had diapers to be changed and all that good stuff. But we have this timeline of what happens and Herod says we'll take care of the competition. And so Herod decides we're going to kill all the children to and under because he was paying attention. He was paying attention to the wisdom of the wise men but in a wrong manner. Well, the expectation of brutality. Now, just as we saw that Joseph, he listened to God. He was available to God. When God said jump, and I forgot to mention this, do you remember when Joseph left? He waited two weeks. He prayed about it. He said he left at night. And, and it, it appears that he left right after the angel spoke to him. 
Boy, that's a word about being nudged, isn't it, by God? How quickly are we prepared to move when God says move? How quickly are we prepared to move? But just as one followed righteousness, there's one who's, who's following evil. And I want to just really encourage you, joking, listen, there, there's evil in this world. There is brutality in this world, and we see it every day on the news. There are people that, uh, I, I hate to use the word enjoy, but it seems that they enjoy killing people, and we saw that this week in, oh, I got it, not Pakistan, but I, Isaac Stan. Uh, killed 19 of the people there, and how how some some uh, nations will kill their own people because they think that shows authority and it shows power. So we'll just kill our own people, and then everybody will respect us. I don't think so. But that's evil, and there is evil in the world, and we need to understand there's evil. And one of the things that kept striking me as I was reading about this is so often we think if I'm doing... Everything that God wants me to do, nothing bad will ever happen. Just ain't so, folks. And I don't know, and I've been trying to tell you all this for a long time. If somebody said, if you got saved, you'd never have another problem in your life, they lied to you. But listen, we have the help of the living God. And God protected Joseph and Mary and Jesus and sent them out of town, but evil was still at work. And, and this in no way helps at all, but one of the things that scholars said that the area that, that, that Joseph and Mary were living in, there would probably have been no more than about 30 infants or two years and under. I don't know how they get all that information. And that's brutal enough, isn't it? 30 children were murdered because someone was afraid they would lose power. And, and it, this one commentary, it was almost like, well, this should be an encouragement, but any loss of a child's life is brutality. Well, on the move reveals the necessity and the power of obedience to sustain life. Obe obedience brings life. And you know, I thought about what a, a, a basic concept. If I obey God, I may die here. And Jesus said, uh, don't fear them that can kill the body. You remember that? But fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Listen, there is a judgment. But listen, when we choose God, we're promised life. And the way to life is narrow, but the way to destruction is wide. But when we obey God, we know we're choosing life. Well, and into obscurity. This was kind of strange for me. I, I'm, I'm geographically challenged. Uh, I'm not sure which direction is Kannapolis. I think it's that way. Am I right? And that's Concord, maybe? Oh, that's Kannapolis. Oh, see, there's no hope for me. But what's interesting is here we have uh, Joseph and Mary and Jesus in Egypt. We don't know specifically how long they stayed. And remember that he had to listen again because the angel said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you again later. you got to be waiting. So later what happens? The angel says, you got to go. And what does it say Joseph did? He just keeps doing the same. He got up and went. And I hope I can be that person. You know, do you hope that's who you are? That the next time God talks, you just get up and go. I mean, if he says, budge, okay, I'm budging. I mean, if he nudges me, I'm going to be nudged. And so in the process of time, Joseph, that's the next thought there, in the process of time, Joseph has had to wait. What's really interesting, we don't get Mary getting the information. We don't have other people bringing somebody the information. We get this whole character reference on Joseph, that he was a godly, godly man who obeyed what God said to him. And you know, this really got to my heart as I thought about Jesus, what he could say about his dad growing up. My daddy, when God told him to move, moved. My dad did what God wanted him to do. Now, <laughs> Jesus could probably say, my dad did what the Lord told him to do. I know, I'm the Lord. <laughs> but we know the separation there. And yet there was, this, there was this process of time, and sometimes we don't like the process of time. Good things come to those who right, don't pray for patience. <laughs> well, we here we have clear guidance given, and the angel of the Lord says, you need to go back to Israel because Herod is dead. Isn't that interesting? 
Listen, the one you fear is dead. Now, what happened when Herod died, he had left uh, Israel or his territory divided up into three pieces, and he had three sons, and each son got a piece of the pie. But Archelaus was the worst son because he fought exactly like his dad did. Archelaus liked killing people. And so, so interesting, not only does Joseph get told, you've got to go back to Israel, he's warned again, and it looks like maybe it's a little bit later, maybe not at the exact same time, he's warned again because what? He's still listening. He's still listening to God. Say, so listen, that Archelaus is still up there, and you need to keep moving in another direction. And so he ends up in Nazareth. Now, I may be wrong again, and our scholars can look this up, but everything I read about Nazareth, it was a very, very small town. It, it, was, it was kind of obscurity. It wouldn't be a place where everybody would be coming through, that everybody uh, might be able to. It, it's not like going to Charlotte. It wasn't a place uh, of celebration. It was just a small community. And you think about what God does. You know, sometimes God sends us to a place of obscurity. And when I first got saved, uh, Irene Smith mentored me, and she loved that song, Little as Much. When God is in it, labor not for wealth or fame. There is a crown, and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. Is the place you're called to labor, is it small and little known? It is great if God is in it, and He'll not forsake His own. You know, Sometimes the Lord says, I need you to be right where I need you to be. And it may not look like much, but it'll be right where I want you. And I thought, you know, what a place for Jesus to grow up. We don't hear about him. Uh, well, we'll hear a little bit more about him next week. But we don't really, we don't know what all happens till he's about 30, right? We're going to see one more little avenue here coming up next week. But, but what a place just to grow up, a small town. He could just be a part of the community. His mom and dad could be a part of the community. We know Joseph is a carpenter that he, because Jesus is a carpenter's son. It was a nice place for Joseph just to be able to work, just be able to work, go about his business, raise his family. We know they have a lot more kids later on. And so, and off we go. And off we go. The point here is that God wants us to be available to move, and he wants us to be willing to go, and he expects us to keep listening. And if we keep listening, he can keep leading us to the place that's safe, where he can grow us up, where he can help us mature, where he can keep us from dying. And you know, I've said this, and a lot of you have said this to me, if I hadn't got saved, I'd probably be dead now. Anybody else can testify to that besides me? Some of us did some really stupid stuff before we knew Jesus. Now, it doesn't mean we everything we've done since wasn't uh, too crazy, but... I've done some stupid stuff, but God, when he saved me, he saved me for a purpose. And he kept me alive before then because he had a purpose, and I guess he knew I'd say yes. Are you listening? Can you hear the Father speak? Well, on the move clarifies God's plan and the ability of humanity to follow him. His kingdom will come. His kingdom's coming, and that's why we pray today. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, here on earth as it is in heaven. Well, I was going to have Michael sing one more song, but uh, I knew I'd run out of time. So here's a few words from the hymn writer. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. I'll go with him, with him, all the way. If he speaks, what are you going to do? Let's stand together. Let's pray. Lord, you know us. <laughs> you already know the answers that we'll make, but Lord, would you help us even this moment declare, decide, determine that when you speak, we're going to say yes. That when you speak, we're going to go in your direction because we know it is for our benefit, it is for our good, it is for our life. So Lord, help us. And Lord, I pray for me and I pray for all of us today to predetermine 
that we're going to go your way. Lord, if there's someone here that's been wrestling with that, whether they should honor you or not, whether they should listen or not, whether they would give in and submit or not, help them this very moment to say, yes, Lord, your way is better. Your will be done. Jesus, even as you modeled in the garden in great turmoil and pain, not my will, but thine be done. Help us all to speak that truth and then to follow it up, even as Joseph did, as getting up and going. Lord, help us. Help us to be your people. And Lord, we're going to be grateful because you alone can do it. You alone can transform the heart and the mind as we surrender to you. So Lord, do for us what we cannot do for ourselves, and we will give you great thanks and praise, and we do so in the matchless name of Jesus, and let all God's kids say together, Amen and Amen. Well, we're going to hear a benediction from the very end of 1 Corinthians 15, 58, and all i got to do is find it. There it is. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Go with God. He goes with you. Thank you for being here. Thank you.